Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. It is Wednesday, March 22nd, about 36 degrees, a little cool, sunny here on the eastern part of Long Island in Setauket, and uh, I'm really excited about uh, today's show. Uh, my special guest is Adam Grossman. Adam, hello, Adam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you as well. Good. Good. Glad to have you here. Let me just tell uh, my listening audience who Adam Grossman is. And I'm really excited about this because uh, I'm a huge sports fan my entire life. Um, I uh, was never good, uh, really that good competitively as a player, but uh, excited, uh, uh, an avid sports fan. But Adam Grossman is the CEO and founder of Block 6 Analytics, a leading sports sponsorship and analytics company dedicated to helping brands and sports properties maximize sponsorship value through B6A's proprietary technology. Adam is a lecturer for Northwestern University Masters of Sports Administration, where he's developed the course Entrepreneurship in Sports and co-developed Sports Management Analytics. He is the co-author of The Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High Performance Industry, which was the featured book at the 2015 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. His work has been featured in publications including Forbes, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, Comcast Sportsnet Chicago, and Oxford University Press. Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, Adam Grossman. Great to be here. I uh, appreciate you having me on the program. Well, I could have kept uh, I could have kept going on with your very impressive bio. I tried to be as brief as possible, but uh, I, I do have to say excitedly, uh, I'm really ex. Very excited to have you have you on here because I really um, this is my uh, 71st show since July 26th when I launched the Dean Blackman show with my soon to be 90 year old mom, Jean Blackman, down in Delray <laughs> Beach, Florida. And I've really never had anyone yet really in the sports industry uh, at, at this point. So. Uh, thank you for being with us today. And uh, why don't we just delve into, uh, uh, tell us, Adam, uh, about Block 6 Analytics and what, yeah, and what makes what makes your services so unique? Yeah, well, one, I appreciate the, the kind words. Uh, I know it'll make my mom very happy to hear that you're, <laughs> to hear the introduction and makes her uh, excited that her, uh, my parents' education dollars went to good use. Uh, they're always excited about that. Uh, but in terms of my company, Block 6 Analytics, so one of the things that I think um, other people can understand is, you know, what we do is we try to create and determine a value of sports sponsorship assets. So what that means is, you know, you're in New York City and, you know, I don't know if you're a Mets fan or not, but, you know, the uh, Mets stadium is called City Field. So what we want to determine for the Mets and for Citigroup is what is the value to City uh, by being named City Field. Uh, we've developed uh, some technology and, uh, and a model that does that. So one of the things that we look at from our technology is what's called our media analysis platform. So that's basically how frequently is something on television or on a live streaming broadcast. So if City is on television, our system can automatically capture it and then put a value to it so that City in, in near real time can see the value of a game. So, if, you know, if the Mets, which, um, you know, I'm sure is going to happen this year is if the Mets make it the World Series, then you know, they could say, you know, to City, great game last night. Here, you know, your sign was on screen for this amount of time. Here's the value that you got from that. And that's not something that's really existed in the sports industry before. 
Um, and we have a bunch of different service offerings like that that help people really understand why it makes sense to, to value sponsorship. Wow, remarkable. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned out of all the sports teams and franchises that you mentioned, you, you said to me, uh, am I a Mets fan? And let me just go back. I know I've told this story a, a number of times, but I think uh, it's important for you to hear when you said, am I a Mets fan? Growing up as, uh, as a young kid, uh, growing up uh, Freeport, Long Island on the South Shore, I was a huge Mets fan. I mean, I was such a Mets fan that uh, I would cry any time Tom Seaver would lose. He was, uh, he was my idol as a, as a kid growing up. So it goes on and on about the Mets. Um, I know you're much younger than me, but I'll never forget back in 1969, the Mets were in the World Series against the Orioles. And uh, during those days, uh, there were no night games. It was only during the day. So uh, back in 69, I was 12 years old. I did everything possible to convince my mother that I had a fever and that I was sick because... (laughs) I had to watch Tom Seaver and the Mets turn into the Miracle Mets and beat the Baltimore Orioles that year. So that's uh, that's a little bit to tell you what kind of a Mets fan well, I am. Uh, as the years went on and as I got older, um, uh, I became also uh, basically a, a, Mets, a, a baseball fan. Uh, an avid uh, baseball fan. So uh, the Yankees and the San Francisco Giants have also become uh, a very strong favorites of mine as well. So that's well, that's my that's my story. Those, that's my story about being a Mets fan. Well, on both of those fronts, I, I have a almost connection to one is uh, now that my company is based in Chicago and in 1969, I believe the Mets passed the Cubs in order to make, uh, the world series to begin with. So if the Cubs hadn't collapsed as they had typically done in the past, which obviously has changed now that they've won the world series and you can talk about those things, uh, more, fr- more freely, but if it weren't for the Cubs, you know, and the Mets that, um, and, and I actually just recently wrote a chapter about the Chicago Cubs. That's why it's top of mind for a book that's coming out uh, later this year. But the idea here is that, you know, the Cubs, if it weren't for the Cubs, there might not be the the Miracle Mets. And I also grew up in the D.C. area. And before there was the Washington Nationals, I was a huge uh, Baltimore Orioles fan and was a big fan of Cal Ripken, among other players. And so I I actually do know more, uh, more about the amazing Mets than maybe other people my age. Wow. Wow. That's some story. And uh, the Cubs, tremendous history. So uh, it was great. They had a great team the last couple of years, and it was great to see them win the World Series. Absolutely. Listen, Adam, could you, I I know there's going to be a lot of uh, new novice people, maybe not sports enthusiasts, but uh, all kinds of people that tune in to your show uh, with me and Uh, Do you mind just breaking down a little bit this word analytics and exactly what it is? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think people, uh, and again, not to self-promote, even though that's obviously what I've been doing the past couple minutes, but the idea, uh, we actually, I I provide, or my co-authors and I in the Sports Strategist, our book, we provide a definition of analytics and modeling. And at the most basic level, modeling is just a mathematical representation of reality. So when you say two plus two equals four, it's really because you have two of something and then you have two of something else. And that together, those group of items equal four. When you're talking about analytics, analytics is really just, you know, using mathematical modeling or, you know, using numbers in order to better represent what's actually occurring. And if you think about it that way, hopefully it becomes a little less scary in that, you know, one of the most common in baseball, or if your audience has seen, or you know, Moneyball the movie, or uh, read the book Moneyball, you know, the basic use of analytics that they found, and what the Oakland A's found, is that people, uh, sports teams, in particular baseball teams, were not accurately reflecting offensive performance because they weren't reflecting uh, walks, and they weren't reflecting, you know, every way that somebody gets on base. And they were mostly focused on batting average. And batting average was not the, actually the most accurate reflection of somebody's offensive performance. And by using data and using numbers, they found a better way and they were able to win more games because they were using a way, uh, using data in a way that better represented somebody's offensive ability so they could find players for less money 
and that would have a similar or better level of offensive performance. And that at a, at a you know at a basic level, and not even a basic level, at a, at a foundational level, is really how analytics work. Wow, wow. When when did you decide to really pursue sponsorship analytics as a career and uh, developing your own company? Yeah, so you know we were talking about this a little bit before we came on air, but. Um, you know, both of us have kind of reinvented ourselves, although obviously I, I didn't have as much ex- you know, experience before I reinvented myself. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. Uh, I never even, it never even occurred to me, one, to work in sports, or two, to be an entrepreneur until I went to business school. So I went to business school at NYU. Uh, I went to undergrad at Northwestern. So if you go on my company's website, everything is purple because every school I went to is purple. Um, so we will always be purple and I'll be purple at heart. But Uh, At NYU, in between my first and second year of business school, I worked for the Washington Capitals, and uh, the Capitals were then and are now a very progressive team in the sports industry in terms of how they um, want to, you know, generate revenue and looking for new ways to maybe increase the uh, ways that they make money. One of the things they had done, they created the first female affinity group or the first female fan group called the Scarlet Capitals, and they were looking for a sponsor for the Scarlet Capitals. And the sponsorship team didn't necessarily have the best way of determining what the value could be for a sponsor and determine the best way to get sponsors involved so that they could see that this new piece of inventory was available. So originally, I was actually doing this, uh, what became my company, as a class project when I got back uh, to business school in the fall. And then I realized, you know, if the Washington Capitals needed this type of information, that other teams would need this type of information and then once I discovered that other teams needed this information, then I realized that the, the sponsors themselves and the you know advertising agencies that work with sponsors would also need this type of information. So it kind of grew from that basic idea. It wasn't necessarily something that I set out to do, which it's I really did. I actually did wake up in the middle of the night because I couldn't sleep because I thought this idea was a good idea. And from that, I started building the company. And only a few years later, we're... we're uh, had the success that we had, but you know it took a long time. But um, you know we're happy with where the company is, and we think the company will be growing significantly in the next uh, few years as well. Wow! So what year? What year did you get started with the company? Uh, in its current iteration, in 2013, I had you know when I was in business school, and then when I uh, finished business school, I did it to a certain degree in um, like basically. I did consulting work plus doing the company really full time since 2013. Mm, very interesting. Um, it's uh, you know when when did you decide? You know, analytics seems to uh, be the trending topics in sports these days. And I know you just gave a presentation at the renowned MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference earlier this month where other featured speakers included NBA commissioner Adam Silver, tech billionaire, entrepreneur, and owner of the Mavericks, Mark Cuban, chairman and CEO of Wasserman, Casey Wasserman, former NBA champion Shane Battier, and the list goes on and on. So for all my listeners who aren't familiar with the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, why don't you tell us all what it's all about and what makes that conference so special? Yeah, I mean, it's humbling to be in that list of speakers, and I think I'm probably the one who doesn't fit in that list, but I appreciate you including me in that list of speakers. Um, the Sloan Sports Analytics came about, and it's exactly for the reason you kind of d- described. It's There were people who were looking at the games uh, at sports differently and wanted to use numbers and data to better look at sports. And there wasn't necessarily a place to do that where everybody could come together and find like-minded people who were looking at information in the same way. Uh, It really started um, Daryl Morey, who's now the Houston Rockets general manager. He went to MIT Sloan. Uh, He and Jessica Gelman really started the conference because, you know, they wanted people who could think differently and think, you know, think differently than other people, but a lot of people who thought the same way about sports, uh, mostly focused at first on what happened on the field to be able to come together and discuss those issues. The conference has since grown 
significantly given the rise of analytics in sports, but it also includes not just on the field, but off the field items as well. And now it really has become, you know, if you think about numbers and data in sports, whether on field or off field, Sloan has really become the featured conference because it was there before, If and you can forgive me for saying this, before analytics were cool. I'm not sure analytics were ever cool, but they I guess they've become cooler. And, you know, they were, because it was there at the foundation, it's really grown as the place to be um, for this type of information. Now, there are other conferences that cover, that look at, analytics and sports both on the field and off the field but sloan has really established itself as uh, a leader if not the leader in that type of conference very impressive and you had said earlier that you don't want to come across like you're too self-promoting yourself uh, <laughs> i uh i'm very humbled and gracious that you're here on the show today and uh you're really a, a, a legend in your industry and i want you to self-promote yourself all you want because the Dean Blackman show is about inspiring and in educating and having some humor along the way. And exactly. it, it, it's really a platform for really people in business and doing some great things out there that it's, uh, I've, I have a platform uh, here, my show, it gives people like you an opportunity to come on and don't hold back because I want to help uh, spread it around the world about, uh, Adam Grossman and uh, the CEO and founder of Block Six Analytics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I do tell my students is, if you're not going to be your best advocate, then who will be? Right? You have to be able to promote yourself. You have to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, then who's going to believe in you? And the idea of, you know, there's a borderline, obviously, between self confidence and arrogance, but and you definitely don't want to cross that line, but. You have to be able, you know, and one of the things that you've, I, I know you've found and something that I found is being an entrepreneur. One of the things that's good about entrepreneurship is, you know, people didn't know who I was or didn't know what my company was. And I really had to work hard to promote it and gain traction and gain success in the industry. And we're still working hard to do that. We're still working hard to, to build up our company and our brand and our industry. And you have to be willing to um, talk about when you're doing things well and doing things right or doing things differently in ways that can resonate with other people and in ways that do, um, you know, create points of differentiation. So people feel compelled to say, Oh, I have to talk to that person or I want to learn more about what they're doing or, or I want to see, you know, what kind of, uh, service offerings they have or what kind of products they have and having the ability to communicate that hopefully effectively. And usually that involves a little humor, uh, is something that really, when you have to sell yourself, uh, you get better at, at communicating and talking about and promoting yourself to a certain degree as well. Well, listen, before I move on to some other areas of conversation, I do have to say, and you are very humble. I mean, it's Adam, it's pretty impressive uh, for you to be in a group of uh, other speakers like NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, uh, Mark Cuban. Uh, and uh, Casey Wasserman, along with Shane Battier. That's pretty. Uh, that's a pretty uh, strong list of speakers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they obviously were in a different room speaking than I was in, but, and they had a slightly larger audience. But I mean, that's what you have to do. I mean, that's when you're talking about. You know, you have to be able to show that you're an industry expert. You have to show that you're an industry leader. These conferences do allow me and others to really show. Um, what it is that makes them different and unique and special. And people come to these conferences to learn. And, you know, people also come to these conferences to network. And there's not, nothing wrong with networking. And that's something, you know, you learn in business school or otherwise. But at the end of the day, people come to these conferences as well to learn. And you want to be able to talk. And, and that's something that people come to my classes for. And, you know, being able to be a, a lecturer at Northwestern's Masters of Sports Administration program where I've been able to either develop or help develop two classes or teach a third class. You know, I really do find value and I really do get a lot of value myself in teaching others and hopefully teaching other people to look differently about the sports industry than they would have in the past. And, you know, making data and making numbers hopefully a little less uh, scary, for lack of a better term, and being able to communicate things and have people learn things that they wouldn't have known otherwise. And if I'm able to do that, at conferences or in classes or through my business, then that's where I'll really be able to achieve success. Excellent. So listen, let's spend a little bit more time on this MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, sure. If you could get into a little bit more, Adam, uh, talk to me about the rise of analytics 
within sports and where are we seeing analytics come into play and where is is it have the biggest impact? Yeah, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, this is not just in sports, but this is also in all of business that people want to use numbers and data to drive decisions. And whether that's on the field or off the field, the idea that, you know, people necessarily making decisions solely from, you know, for lack of a better term, their gut or from their own personal experience is no longer the best way to own or should no longer be the only way to make decisions. There's no question that experience uh, matters and that people who can understand what's going on through their personal experience does matter. But where things have changed, particularly in the sports industry and the reason that Moneyball was so successful and the reason that analytics have really been permeating throughout the sports industry is that people's experiences are subjective, where numbers, not always, but can be more objective. And the idea of taking numbers and understanding numbers and understanding performance and trying to figure out really what's causing the changes in performance is something that really is driving the sports industry. So from my perspective at Block 6 Analytics, we're really looking at, uh, for the most part, we're focused on sponsorship spend and how does, um, you know, what can, how can sponsors better spend their money and how can teams better communicate the value that they're generating through sponsorship without really looking at the numbers and really looking at data, it's hard to really create and communicate that value or really examine what that value is. My company's also developed a model called uh, Revenue Above Replacement, which is based off the, base, the, the core baseball analytics called Wins Above Replacement. Our Revenue Above Replacement model is about how does a player's on-field and off-field performance help a team generate revenue. And just looking at players not just as their perceived ability to potentially help a team win, but really look at how a, team, how a player helps a team make money because as – you know, as, as as probably regular fans know, the sports is a business and the businesses, you know, a lot of businesses are focused on trying to generate revenue and trying to generate profit and being able to look at the players in the way that other companies traditionally look at their employees and using numbers and data to do that is something that can be really valuable to sports teams. And again, it's, it goes back to the concept I was just talking about before is using numbers allows you to think differently. It allows you to potentially create points of differentiation between you and other teams. And it, and it allows you to really or try to better understand what are the things that are driving impact for your organization. And when you're talking, the reason that numbers are so valuable in sports and the reason that the analytics conference gets you know thousands of people who attend there, uh, is, or one of the big reasons, is because you know numbers help people understand uh, what's going on better and can help try, you know, help them identify better players. It can help them identify better business practices. It can help them better connect with the fans and the media and being able to do that in a better way, it, you know, is a big reason why analytics are so valuable in sports. Wow. Wow. You have, uh, you have followed a uh, sports your entire life and now have created a business that's de- dedicated to helping sports leagues helping teams, brands, and agencies maximize sponsorship. How has the industry evolved over the last 10 years? Yeah, it's, again, a very good question. Um, You know, the industry is changing. You know, one of the biggest things, and I know we keep talking about this, one of the biggest things is the impact of analytics, uh, the impact of data, and the impact of big data, the idea of, being able to measure things that potentially couldn't be measured before, uh, that's a huge factor that's driving the change in the industry. And probably the second biggest factor is technology. Um, you know, there's a companies 10 years ago that didn't even exist that have a huge impact on sports um, and not just sports. I mean, obviously, Twitter has had a big impact in other uh, arenas that maybe we don't want to go into on this podcast. But, um, you know, Twitter, Snap, uh, Instagram, you know, those companies didn't even exist 10 years ago. And those are some things that, you know, those are areas that have really impacted the sports industry, Uh, electronic ticketing, um, using mobile devices in order to pay for item, you know, pay for concessions at games or to swipe in your ticket uh, when you go to a game, Uh, being able to get targeted advertising and promotion on your phone based off your purchasing behavior, Uh, being able to watch, you know, no longer just watching sports on a television, but potentially being able to watch it on a tablet or a mobile device. I mean, the impact of technology on sports is astronomical, and it's only going to get, you know, it's only going to continue to evolve. One of the things that is happening with the NCAA tournament this weekend 
uh, is that NBA, uh, CBS and Turner for the first time are going to potentially broadcast games in virtual reality uh, where people, if you have virtual reality capabilities, can get all of these different views to the point where you are potentially going to be able to see essentially the similar view that the players on the court see, or you can sit next to the coach, or you could sit next to the owner. Uh, well, not an NCA. You could sit next to maybe the athletic director. But the idea of having a virtual experience that makes it seem like you're actually at the game, but you're watching it on a screen or watching it through a virtual reality device, again, could fundamentally alter what's going to happen in the sports industry. And it can make it so people get even more engaged and more involved with sports. So they really, in the past 10 years in particular, the impact of technology has had a huge uh has a huge driving force on what's changing and will continue to change the sports industry. Wow, that's unbelievable. You know, you brought up uh, March Madness and the NCAA basketball tournament, uh, what they call the big dance. And I just want to let you know from the very beginning, uh, this wasn't a emotional decision, but a basketball decision. I picked uh, Michigan to win the cha- <laughs> championship. <laughs> Well, it's looking pretty good right now. <laughs> okay, so go blue to everybody out there. Uh, I'm looking pretty good. I don't. I didn't use analytics on that though. Yeah, I mean, I picked. Uh, well, I didn't. Pick, so Northwestern made the NCAA tournament for the first time in the school's history. At Northwestern actually had hosted an NCAA tournament final, but had never participated in an NCAA tournament for basketball until this season. Uh, I did pick them to win. I almost picked them to beat upset Gonzaga, but even I had my limits on on what I would pick. And yet they Northwestern almost beat Gonzaga. But Michigan had, you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about, and one of the things that's actually very important for my business in the sports industry in general is narrative and storytelling. And people connect with sports because of the great stories in sports. You know, as you know, definitely you want to use data and analytics, but uh, to evaluate the impact of narrative, but. The reason that people are fans of sports, or one of the big reasons, is because of the stories. Whether it's the underdog story or overcoming adversity, and you know, Michigan in in particular, the fact that they, you know, they almost got in a plane crash that could have, you know, severely injured if not killed, you know, a big chunk Mm of the majority of the team, if not the entire team and the coaching staff, and to go from that to winning the Big Ten tournament to you know upsetting Louisville to the place where they are now, just it's an incredible story and. You know, if nothing else, uh, you know, cheering for that story and and watching that story as it unfolds to the NCAA tournament, if nothing else, should be really interesting. And now they're also playing really well. And, you know, I think it's they have a good shot at making the, the final four. Yes, yeah, sports, uh, as you know it, it's about how you're playing at that time and winning. And during the season, uh, uh, you know, they weren't uh, they were winning, but weren't, weren't winning enough. And uh, here they get. Uh, hear that uh, awful experience of uh, the plane and uh, they you know the last couple of weeks they're uh, they're probably the hottest uh, team right now the way they're playing in uh, NCAA well, bas- I have basketball to, I have to caution you there's a momentum in sports is very hot topic and in particular most analytical models or most people who are into uh, or pursue analytics really downplay momentum in sports so Interesting. Not, not that that's that, that, uh you know the, the the narrative often is momentum even though the outcome and the numbers don't often bear that out uh but again i, I think this is sometimes where experience and analytics can collide particularly when it comes it's it's definitely a controversial topic uh, about momentum wow this is no this is good that this happened uh, spontaneously with you and i on this word momentum you know besides myself using it just now with you it's commonly used uh, you know whether you're in a sports bar or you're at work or at home you know people use the word uh, constantly uh momentum so a team is hot uh why don't you right. just uh why don't you comment uh on what you just well, said I, it, it usually most of more focuses like on the individual performer, uh, you know, in terms of like the hot hand, there's what's called the hot hand fallacy where people think that their, their performance is actually, they think their performance is much better than it actually is over an extended period of time. And it causes people potentially in basketball to like take shots they wouldn't normally take because they think they have a hot hand or for, you know, players to get potentially more playing time. Uh, teams also have to a certain degree, uh, a hot hand kind of, uh, performance where, you know, people think that if you're playing well at the end of the season and, you know, prior to going into the playoffs, it can be a predictor of, um, 
the future playoff success when that doesn't usually bear itself out, at least in any kind of statistically significant way in the actual performance. So it's definitely a very hot topic and it's definitely something where, um, you know, it seems like when you look at it, there should be some evidence that that actually exists, although it's hard to find evidence or at least statistically significant evidence that momentum really exists in the way people think it does in sports. Well, listen, uh, more onto that, uh, you know, as I read your book, The Sports Strategist, since we're talking about the issue of momentum, uh, you know, as I read your book, uh, it's mentioned, it's written, it's why is focusing too much on winning actually a losing strategy? Yeah, so one of the core theses or one of the core ideas in the book is that exact idea. So if you're talking about the, again, this is on the business of sports. Um, if you're talking about the business of sports, you know, most sports organizations have somewhere between something like 50 to 100 employees. And most of those employees are not involved. You know, they're not the general manager. They're not the coach. They're not the players. They're not the trainers. They're mostly helping the team, you know, on ticket sales or sponsorship or, or sometimes on media or new, uh, you know, whether it's social media, digital media, broadcast media. They're not working on, you know, they're working on selling the product, not necessarily on building the product. And if, you're, if your team is totally reliant on winning and losing – then you're basically saying those people have no little to no impact on the organization because you're completely dependent on what the team does on the court or on the field or on the ice. And that's just not – A, that it, it doesn't prove itself out. One is that um, there are teams that have lost that have been successful from a business perspective, the Chicago Cubs being probably the most famous example, um, where for years they had one of the worst winning percentages in baseball and then they um, – ended up having, you know, some of the most, uh, from a business perspective, some of the most revenue successful teams and one of the most uh, valuable organizations in baseball, even while they were losing, uh, and vice versa, you know, winning teams aren't always generating revenue. In fact, we talk about an example in the book of the Glasgow Rangers who won the Scottish premier league title and then declared bankruptcy right after and actually got uh, caught up in a, in a legal tax scheme because they couldn't make enough money essentially to pay, pay their players. Um, so, you know, it, it's just a fallacy to think that winning is the only factor that will drive business results. That's what, you know, uh, there's definitely, there, there's no question that winning does have an impact and winning can have a substantial impact on the business results, but you are not necessarily in control of winning teams don't often have a consistent winning pattern. And, you know, one of the examples we used and not to make this totally Chicago centric, but the, Bears at the time, we wrote the book, had the highest winning percentage in the NFL history, and they had only won one Super Bowl, and their winning percentage was something like, you know, I think it was 56 or 58 percent. So if you're only winning 56 to 58 percent of your games in the NFL, and that's really high, then what are you doing the rest of the time, and what are you doing to actually help drive value to your uh, business, and how are you going to sell tickets, how are you going to sell sponsorship, how do you end up, you know, uh, potentially communicating about television rights? Those are all things and topics that we discuss in the book. Adam, I was going to ask you, what is your favorite sport to watch and why? But I think uh, being from Chicago, I think uh, we already have an idea of what your well, favorite I, sport and what your favorite team is to watch and why. Well, actually, I am a uh, – off. you know, on the record, all of my te – the teams that work with us are all my favorite teams. Each one of them are all terrific. So on the record, but I grew up uh, – I grew up in D.C. I'm actually a D.C. sports fan. I actually played soccer in college, so I guess it's, you know, for playing sports, I guess it was soccer. Uh, watching sports, you know, I, I do like to watch a lot of different sports, um, and I, I at, ho at heart, in terms of just being a pure fan, because I grew up in the D.C. area, I'm a fan of the D.C. sports teams, which recently, you know, they've had some pretty dramatic uh, playoff losses or losses going into the regular season, you know, at the end of the regular season this year with the Redskins, where they lost to the to the Giants, um, which, which was pretty bad. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, one of the things that I, I will say, I, I, one of the concerns I actually had when starting the company is that I would potentially, because I was working in sports so much, I'd potentially not want to watch sports when actually it's almost, and at times I, I do want to get a break, but I actually do almost like sports and watching sports even more because I know, you know, so much more about it and I know, you know, potentially some of the people on the business side and, you know, it, 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 it is work, but it's also, you know, you said it at the beginning or earlier in this, uh, podcast, 
you know, the ability to work in something that you loved and loved since, and for me, since I was a little kid and something I'd always loved, even though it wasn't necessarily purely sponsorship, but the ability to work in the sports industry and work in the industry I love and build a company that, you know, we think adds can, you know, potentially fundamentally change the way that uh, a certain part of the industry works is really awesome. And being able to watch, you know, games and, you know, uh, I, I like watching a lot of different sports and having that opportunity is something I'm, uh, I'm very excited about. I think it's unbelievable when you could wake up every day and love what you're doing. And I could definitely feel it in you. Yeah. Well, what that Mark Twain quote, right? If you, if you're doing something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Now this is definitely work and it's not always when you, know, you get something started and you know, it's probably from your own experience. There's a lot of work involved, but you know, again, at the end of the day, if you're doing something you like to do, it's hard to beat that. I want to second it as the host of the Dean Blackman show. I just want to make sure that everybody listening to this is very clear that Adam Grossman loves all sports teams out there. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody's, exactly. everybody's, equally. I love them all, all equally, all, <laughs> all equally. I just want to make sure that uh, Dean Blackman as the host of the Dean Blackman show that I, uh, I second that and endorse it. Let's, uh, let's move on because uh, the show's soon going to come to a close. Now looking ahead, Adam, over the next 10 plus years, what do you see as the next innovation or technology that will change the way we watch sports? Yeah, I think I talked about it a little bit before, but I do think it's virtual reality. Um, the idea of having that kind of experience where you can have the same view and, the, you know, as potentially somebody at, at the stadium or potentially the quarterback or the point guard or um, you know, same view as the coach or the owner. I think that will change it. I don't think that's happening anytime in the near future. Uh, I think, you know, virtual reality will take a, a while, uh, you know, probably at least, at least three to five years, if not longer to, uh, become a way that people uh, can experience the game. Actually, one of the issues right now to a certain degree is that is there is a level of motion sickness that comes in sometimes for some people when they watch the games, which is something I think that needs to be ironed out. Uh, but I do think virtual reality will change not just sports. I think it'll change how people, you know, and all media and entertainment and potentially beyond that, how people, you know, kind of interact with the world it could potentially really change by, uh, uh, you know, advances in virtual reality. Wow. Unbelievable. What are your thoughts on team location? relocation uh last year we saw the st louis rams return to la and now we're hearing about the oakland raiders moving to las vegas um is this good for sports no comment <laughs> no comment <laughs> uh, i will say in the chapter in the book that we write we do uh in one of the chapters is focused on it's called a. Uh, um, generate or generating or building public support. Uh, we talk about relocation there. Uh, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it depends on what the, the specific team is trying to accomplish. And that probably that chapter best reflects uh, our thinking or my thinking on that subject. Other than that, I, no comment. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, once again, the book, <laughs> the book that you co-authored is The Sports Strategist. How, how do people buy it? Yeah, you can go on Amazon and do a, uh, just a search for the sports strategist. You can also go on Oxford University Press's website and similarly do the sports strategist. Uh, you can check out uh, Block 6 Analytics at uh, Block the Number 6 Analytics. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Adam R. Grossman as well. Uh, and you can check out the company uh, on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash Block 6 Analytics as well. Well, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to talk about? No, I think we, we got it all covered. Um, although I do potentially, uh, maybe the, the craziest thing you ever did at a Mets game or the craziest way you stayed home from school for the Mets would maybe be <laughs> interesting to hear. You thought that was crazy, huh? No, no. If there was anything more crazy than faking a fever, I don't know if you did anything else in your fandom that was No, a but crazy that's unbelievable. Experience. I pulled it off with my mother and I stayed home yeah. for I stayed home for the entire World Series and saw one of the greatest uh still today, one of the greatest uh, sports stories in baseball and uh and obviously in sports. That was quite a team and quite well, a uh, quite yeah, a surprise she, upset. 
Yeah, obviously she didn't take it too personally if she's helping you with the podcast now. Which is great. Not at all. She <laughs> is uh, my number one fan, and uh, and people are constantly asking uh, for my mom to come back on the show. I'm going to be down in uh, Florida soon. Uh, I also have a second show then when I'm not in my studio. I have a second show that's called Dean on the Street, and uh, people can follow me on Dean Blackman on my Facebook page, uh, that wherever I am in in the world, anywhere, um, that Dean on the Street uh, ends up talking to people wherever I go. So uh, who knows, that might uh, be next uh, for you and I, that uh, whether it be in Chicago or New York or anywhere you're traveling, that Dean on the Street is more uh, two-minute to eight-minute segments that are very spontaneous. Spontaneous. So on on that note, uh, I know you're extremely busy, and uh, I want to thank you very much for your time and for coming on the show. Once again, my guest has been Adam Grossman, CEO and founder of Block Six Analytics, a leading sports sponsorship and analytics company dedicated to helping brands and sport properties maximize sponsorship value through B6A's proprietary technology. I wish you uh, great success, the best of health, and uh, once again, uh, you're welcome back on the show anytime you want, Adam. Well, I may take you up on that, so be careful what you wish for. Anytime you want. And as I said, as I said, we don't have to do long shows like this, uh, and I do shows out of studio. And as I said, Dean on the street uh, can go anywhere. Great. Well, so, it's great to be on the program. I so really on, that. on that note, I would thank, uh, I would like to uh, just mention uh, to all my listeners, I want to thank everybody uh, for being with us today. And uh, once again, if anybody would like to be a guest on the show, tell their story, tell their experience, talk about their careers, their jobs, they're more than welcome uh, to come on. Like Adam's show, the show will be podcasted. It will be available on YouTube channel, the Dean Blackman Show YouTube channel, also on iTunes for downloading the podcast. And all previous shows are also available on the Dean Blackman Show YouTube channel and on iTunes. If anyone wants to reach me directly, Dean at DeanBlackman.com. And from all of us at the Dean Blackman Show, have a great day. You've been listening to the Dean Blackman Show live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.